homeostasis, not homeostasis. Okay. Hemostasis means literally blood stopping. A lot of times the terms hemostasis and coagulation are used interchangeably. Coagulation basically means making jello. Sorry. Taking a liquid and turning it into a solid. And that's what happens during the coagulation process. Part of the plasma of your blood turns into like a little jelly. It goes from a liquid to a solid. Now, hemostasis, stopping bleeding. You want it to be quick. You want to form a clot quickly, but you only want to form the clot where you broke the blood vessel. If I cut my finger, I don't want to clot you. So you want it to form quickly, but you want it to be localized, and you want this process to be controlled. There is a, if this uh, hemostatic process, if this coagulation process gets out of control, there is a condition called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. DIC. Once a person goes into DIC, it is very difficult to get them back. What happens in DIC, and things that can cause this, uh, during childbirth, if a little bit of the amniotic fluid gets into the mother's bloodstream, that can cause DIC. Uh, certain snake venoms, certain animal venoms can start the clotting process. Um, massive tissue trauma, like if you're in a car accident and a lot of your tissue gets crushed or damaged like that, that can cause you to go into DIC. Yep. What happens is you start forming clots everywhere, and then you use up all your clotting factors, and then you start to hemorrhage. Because you've made clots that you didn't need, and now you can't make the clots you do need. So we, got, we want this process to be fast, but we want it to stay where we need it, and we have to control it carefully so it doesn't get out of control. Remember that blood clotting is one of those things that's a positive feedback loop. Blood clotting and childbirth. All right, now, the phases of hemostasis, three major phases. You have what's called the vascular phase, the platelet phase, phase, platelet phase, and the coagulation phase. So let's see, this is our blood vessel. What are these guys? Platelets, yay! These guys must be the red blood cell. That's so good. Okay. This will be the endothelial cell lining of the blood vessel. This would be like the, the basal lamina, the little blue that's on the outside, a little protein blue. Good. Right. So, blood vessel lining its own business. Ow! <laughs> gets cut. Okay. The endothelial cells are damaged. What happens is the endothelial cells start to release chemicals. All the guts of the cells, the cytoplasm, starts to spill out into the bloodstream. Okay. I'm bleeding! All right, so the first thing that happens is, what? Yeah, the chemicals that are released when you damage a blood vessel stimulates the smooth muscles to constrict. Because if you can decrease the amount of blood flowing through here, hopefully you decrease the amount of blood leaking out. Remember in Black Hawk Down, the guy's femoral artery was cut. And so that artery's got all, the artery's got a lot of tunica media, a lot of smooth muscle and that artery constricted. In fact, it constricted all the way up into his groin and they couldn't get it clamped off. The pressure was so high that even though the blood vessel constricted, it couldn't stop the bleeding. Make sense? All right, then the platelet phase, phase platelet phase, <coughs> okay, where the platelets begin to patch the hole and it's just a temporary patch. And then you have the coagulation phase where you have the fiber clot, those fiber proteins settle down on those on the platelets to keep, to basically give the time, it's like stitches in a way, give the time for the blood vessel to heal itself. All right, so vascular phase, you get what's called vascular spasm. The chemicals that are released from the damaged blood vessel wall 
stimulates those smooth muscles to constrict and contract. Now, what's coming out of the cells? Those endothelial cells, what's being leaked out? ADP, um, prostacyclin. Now, tissue factor, we're going to come back to this. Just remember. Now, what happens is these chemicals are released, the smooth muscle cells begin to contract, and then these chemicals start to make the platelet sticky. Then you go into the platelet phase. And this happens, I mean, this is quick. Uh, if you do a finger stick, within just maybe 10 seconds, you're going to already have a bunch of platelets going to rush to that thing. If they're trying to do a platelet count on somebody, they can't do a finger stick because it gets, it's, it's falsely affected by the clotting process. They have to take the blood out of, the, out of a vein and anticoagulate so that the platelets don't begin to stick together. All right, now the first thing that's going to happen is what's called platelet adhesion. Then you get platelet release. And then you get what's called platelet aggregation. So, <clears throat> there's a lot of this stuff. I, I made this years ago, a really long time ago when I was teaching med tech. So, there's some stuff in here that you don't have to know. You don't have to know about von Willebrand's factor, and you don't have to know about glycoprotein 1B. Okay, so don't, don't get too carried away. But, you do have to know about here's the endothelial cell, here's the basal lamina. That has, these are collagen fibers. Because that's the, the, you know, the collagen fibers are that part of that glue. Um, and then, of course, that's the platelet. Cool. All right. So what happens is when the endothelial cells are damaged, okay, collagen fibers are exposed. The basal lamina, the connective tissue underneath the endothelial tissue is exposed. We talked about the fact that ADP was released from, these, from the cytoplasm of these damaged endothelial cells. And so the platelets begin to adhere to the collagen. The platelets themselves start to change shape. They will release even more chemicals, and then platelets will begin to stick to each other. That's platelet aggregation. So when the platelet sticks to the wall of the blood vessel, that's adhesion. When platelets stick to other platelets, that's aggregation. So. Platelets stick to the endothelial cells, they stick to the, the collagen fibers, and again, this curve, like I said, within about you know, 10 or 15 seconds is very quick. And those platelets that have adhered begin to release chemicals. They release some ADP. They release something called thromboxane A2. That's another one of those icosanoids. Um, they release some of the clotting factors. They release something called this one, platelet-derived growth factor. So when those platelets have stuck, adhered, they begin to release chemicals. And so you're getting this positive feedback, this snowball effect. They change shape. They go from a little disc-like shape to that funny looking thing to the little arms, a little pseudopod stuck out. So they can catch more platelets that are going by. So ADP stimulates um, platelets sticking to each other, more chemicals being released. These guys stimulate more vascular spasm. Um, clotting factors we'll talk about in a minute course perform or are there for clot formation of fiber clot. Um, platelet derived growth factor that actually helps those endothelial cells multiply and repair the damage. Um, calcium ions, those are necessary for both platelets to stick to each other as well as for clot formation. When we talked about the difference between plasma and serum, and I said that if you wanted blood not to clot, you had to put something in put an anticoagulant in the tube, some of those anticoagulants work by sucking up calcium ions. Without calcium ions, you can't make a blood clot. So we already know that calcium ions are important, excuse me, for skeletal muscle cell contraction. They're important for cardiac cell function. They're important for neuron function. They're now important for blood clotting factors. So calcium ions, that's why calcium ion control is so important. Think back to the bone lectures. Calcium ions, two hormones control Calcium ion levels, we're between 9 and 11 milligrams per deciliter. Calcium gets too low, parathyroid hormone is released. Calcium gets too high, calcium tonin is released. So calcium ions are important. We spend most of our time talking about sodium and potassium, but calcium is also important. All right, and the platelets aggregate, and they basically form this little temporary platelet plug. Now, 
if all you form was the platelet plug, that platelet plug can be easily dislodged. And so the vessel would start to hemorrhage again. But the platelet plug forms the perfect environment for the thyroid clot to form on the top. So it's fast, it slows down the bleeding, and it makes a perfect place for the thyroid clot to form. Now, the last part, the coagulation phase. This is going to start uh, within about 30 seconds of the initial damage. Now, the formation of that fiber clot involves what are called clotting factors or coag factors, coagulation factors. Most of these factors, and there's a bunch of them, thank goodness you're not going to have to know them all. What I'm going to tell you is what we currently understand about clot formation. There's stuff that we still don't understand. Most of these proteins, most of these clotting factors are made by your liver. So one of, the, one of the first signs of liver failure is inability to clot. The liver cells get so damaged they can't normally do all their liver cell functions, one of which is to make clotting factors. So people that go into liver failure begin to hemorrhage. Now, these proteins, these clotting factors are in an inactive form. Because you only want to clot when you need to clot. But you need them there, ready to be activated when you need to form a clot. Does that make sense? And so what happens is you have this snowball, this chain reaction. We call it a cascade reaction. That basically one protein is activated and that, that activates the next protein and that activates the next protein. And you have this you know step-by-step -step process, this cascade that ends up with formation of a fiber. The first one you already know about, fibrinogen. Now, unfortunately, they numbered these factors in the order that they discovered them, not in the order they work. The reason fibrinogen is called factor one is because you've got more of it. You've got so much more of it than the rest of them in the bloodstream, so it was the easiest one to find. Proprobin is factor two. That was the second one they discovered. Now, you've got tissue factor, which is factor three. You've got, well, they discovered, quote, factor four, and then they realized it was calcium. <laughs> you know. There is no factor six. They realized it was one of the other factors. <laughs> so they skipped factor six. Um, seven, eight. People that have hemophilia A are factor eight deficient. There's actually a hemophilia B that they're factor nine deficient. Anyways, there's a whole bunch of these guys. You only have to know the first two, fibrinogen and proton. Coagulation phase has three steps. You have the prothrombinase formation. You have thrombin formation. And you have fibrinogen. 